nobody can tell you necessarily when it's time to rebrand it. You will need to feel and be convinced within yourself that something needs to change. And it can be driven many ways. It can be that you're not achieving certain results that you were expecting. Could be that times are changing and you need to adapt and you're figuring out that, you know, maybe my presence is is sort of <laughs> retro. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, many, there's many reasons that, that a person could become tempted to change brand. Welcome to Make Art, the podcast that helps creatives be creative. Our community of entrepreneurs will show you how to turn your passion into a sustainable income generating endeavor. Broadcasting from Cape Town, South Africa, here's your host, Jerome Lee. Hello friends, this is Make Art. This is the podcast where we encourage and inspire you to get out there and make art. That's right, your art is important and your contribution to society is important. People need music, they need things that are beautiful to look at, they need things that are beautiful to listen to and to enjoy, and so your art is important and that contribution must be recognized and it needs to escape the the cage that is your mind and your imagination and be out in the world for the rest of us to see and experience. I have with me, this is really, really exciting, my brother from another mother, my mister from another sister, Ivy Beats is in the building. Welcome. Nice to be here. Lekker to have you in here. In the Rex studio. In the building. The executioner studio. <laughs> 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 Yo, yes. Um, Ivan, you are a DJ, you are a producer, you are a brand ambassador, you are a resident DJ, in fact, at Expression Session Kayla, you play regularly on the Ready D show, you are also a DJ instructor, what am I missing, fill me in quickly? Yeah, I'm in events now as well, um, we recently acquired an event brand uh, with a partner, um, and apparel as well, it's something new for me, so... Okay, yeah. I'm glad I asked you Venturing out questions. a little bit, venturing out into other avenues. Uh, obviously, this year was a difficult year to do events. It was, let's call it impossible. <laughs> <laughs> let's call it unless, a non-event. <laughs> unless uh, it's online and, um, yeah, online event, really, everybody's doing it. It's a, it's a great thing, but uh, we're looking at a proper event experience. You know, people are into festivals. They like artisanal things, crafts, markets, and uh, so... That's the space that I'd like to ideally be, be operating in and playing in. Okay, so yeah. right now you're kind of biding your time, waiting for things to unlock and relax to a point where you can... I think more than biding time, it's, it's, a, it's a time for really strategizing and really testing uh, ideas without necessarily putting anything out at this stage. So more studying uh, events of the past, uh, what people are currently doing, uh, to define further where I want to be. I think I'm drawing a lot of inspiration from what the guys in the jazz community are doing in terms of events. I think they are completely out of the box compared to what your ordinary party goer events are like. So I like to draw inspiration from what they are doing or what they did before lockdown. And I'd like to explore the possibilities for my brand and see how far it can go Yo, in that's terms got of me, events. That's got me really curious. What are the jazz guys doing? Well, uh, to maybe you love the West Coast, West Coast, no? West Coast. Yeah, 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 yeah. So For you sure. know Titi's by Jazz on the Rocks. Jazz on the Rocks. There's another one also called Moss Jazz. Have you have you seen any of the footage of that? Yeah, yeah. I believe it's the same organizer, so it's very similar in format. But I mean, if you see the footage of that, it's <laughs> it's breathtaking. It's a stage that looks like it's in the middle of the sea, and people just basically park off on the beach. There's vendors. There's I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a different experience, I would imagine, to be sitting there staring at the ocean with this amazing live music. And that's what it's all about, is creating experience. It's not necessarily boxing as many people as you can into a venue in order to make revenue. It's about creating memories and experiences that will have people talking for years to come and leaving that legacy. If you make money, great, awesome, <laughs> fantastic even, marvelous. But if you don't... Um, I still would love to leave that memory and legacy like many of the Cape Town dance institutions have done in the past. People still talk about them today, not because of what they spent, but because of the memories that were made. So that's that's basically the ideal and the goal 
behind uh, the push towards events at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I find it really striking that you're mentioning that because I see this trend with practically everyone I've spoken to to date. It's like all entrepreneurs who I've been talking to will tell me that money is secondary. Money is not the main motivator here. And if you if you are doing something out of a passion and yes. with, with a specific vision, then the Keyword. money will come. Keyword, I think we trade in passion first. Um, if you can get people to buy into your passion, then they will buy into your business model as well, automatically. It's a it's almost a given. So I think people that are passionate about what they do sell way easier than people that force the issue necessarily. That's why um, it's so hard to necessarily join certain of these herbal, herbal life uh, promoters. They're not all equally passionate about what they are doing. And it's not the product or the brand. Um, it's how you as the individual fuel what you're doing. So I think that's that's key, man. Yeah, no, th- look, if you're in the passion business, I think it's the right thing for you because you are someone, I believe, who's just always been really good at allowing your passion for something to shine through, your passion for a project, your passion for a, a pursuit, a hobby mm-hmm. or whatever the case. So I'm definitely keen to see where this goes <laughs> and where your lifestyle brand ends up yeah. next. Like they say in the movies, what happened next? Mm. Yeah. Um, stay tuned for part two. Stay yeah. tuned. Yeah. Previously two. on IV Beats. <laughs> so uh, skip my intro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best function on Netflix, I think. No? Yo, skip awesome. intro. Yo. It's awesome. You know, Show Max doesn't have it. They don't have it. So I they find myself. Find. They don't waste. I find myself involuntarily shouting at the TV. Skip intro. Skip intro. They allow you to skip ten second pieces at a time. Yeah. Which is just not as cool as saying skip intro. Someone sat and determined where does this intro end? Boom. It's, it's also not as clean because I'll skip ahead and then you've missed something yeah. important and you need to go back and then you end up having to watch the intro anyway. I mean, if you had to choose between watching something on Showmax or Netflix, um, they've created the experience for you. Yeah, we come back to that topic yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, so your preference would be there. I think. Yeah, just because the user experience is so much yeah, better and exactly. it's thought through. It's, it's thought thoughtful, out. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ivan, my earliest memory, I, I suppose, of us as friends is um, on high school. I came to your house. My brother brought, brought me over. <laughs> Jim brought me over to your house to meet these two me your DJs. And yeah. you played us like a two-hour <laughs> house set in your bedroom. On turntables with LPs with vinyl, um, and it was again talking about passion. You know, your passion for dance mm. music at the time really shone through, and stuck with me. You know, more than mm. the, how you made an hour pass like twenty minutes, you know, or ten minutes. It was this passion for the music that really shone through. And then subsequently, of course, you and I have been working together. We worked mm. together in a crew called Antioch. Yes, Project Break Free. Um, what I would like to know, right, this is us starting out and performing at the local school carnival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No? On, on the college, on the, on the college sports Yo. field. Um, performing at youth groups. Someone will say, come rap for the children. <laughs> and then we go and we go do something at the, at the, at the bazaar or uh. at the carnival and so forth. How, if at all, have those experiences carried through to where you are now could you take any learnings from those experiences do you feel that they formed the artist that you are today and the brand that you are or or not at all yes i'm pretty sure that uh, a person must respect the journey no matter where you started and how you started and um what was key for me in all of that was um the networking the meeting the people that you met that would later on influence uh, the way you see yourself, perceive yourself as an artist, you you know, um, learning from one another. I used to operate very in a very isolated way, you know. I basically defined what a bedroom DJ is in uh, probably every sense of the word. And to get, start coming out of that shell, it became crucial to meet people and network and work with people. And so I realized, even now, the more people you work with, the more you sharpen your own skill set, the more you expose yourself to your next big thing or your next idea and so really just having a multitude of people that that is in your circle uh, from a music or professional point of view really helps so that was key for me I think that was the spirit of even the way Antioch started it was like the pooling of resources together for a collective mission but unknowingly that also taught me the importance of 
you know broadening your the scope of people that you work with and things like that so yeah uh, uh, yeah. I think that stands out for me as point number one, yeah. And then also you learn from people's professionalism. You learn from how they conduct themselves. Or lack of professionalism. Or lack of. <laughs> 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 yeah, calling a meeting or a rehearsal at 7 a.m. And then means just to get like 10 o'clock in the morning casually or not at all. You know, you learn from those experiences, man. Yeah. <laughs> Life lessons, life yes, lessons. Yes, 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 yes. It's interesting that you talk about networking from that time because I actually think some of the people who we were connected with at that time, and I'm talking now early 2000s, yeah. mid 2000s, you know, 05, 2006, yeah. around there, some of those people we are actually still in contact with yes, today. Yes, most of And we still do work with him. And, uh, I, you know, the relationship has, of course, grown and evolved over time, but those, commu- those relationships are still important today. Mm. Yeah. Most definitely, yeah. And, you know, it's nice to stay in touch like that because um, it's nice to see also where we came from and how everybody grew as a brand or as individuals. Uh, there are obviously those that, that, that dropped out along the way that decided to choose other things in life, better things uh, for them. But for those that are still operating, it's really cool, man, to touch bases and see, you know, what is the man is still busy with and so on. And it's liquor, man. Liquor to catch up and stay in touch with the people and... Just yeah. see where we're going and you know, be inspired by each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and see what people are busy with mm. now and learn from yeah. them and understand how, how they are keeping their careers mm. going and ticking over. <laughs> On that topic, you were known at the time yeah. as DJ Yurinate. Yeah. Yurinate as in year to help uh, slash Yurinate. I help yeah. you to year. There was a whole meaning behind your name. I don't want to say deep because yeah. another friend of mine, he, he said that... Um, when people don't understand something. And then they call it deep. And then they say it's deep. <laughs> but you actually had like quite a few um, explanations for what yeah. Yuri Night was about and where the background was there. Are. And over time, you actually established yourself mm. as a brand in your own right. I mean, yeah. we started out kicking together as Antioch. There were four yeah. of us. But the Yuri Night brand, you took it and you ran with it. You mm. released music under that name. Yeah. You produced the B-Boy Tools project under that name. Um, you played gigs under that yeah. name, solo gigs. So it wasn't, I'm trying to just sketch the, the background for anybody yeah. listening that you weren't under the, exclusively under the umbrella mm. of the group yeah. of an Antioch or of a Project Break Free and so on. So now you've got this really established DJ brand. Mm. People know Yuri Naid, they like Yuri Naid. <laughs> and then one day you decided... But not for a year. And you rebranded as Ivy Beats. What was that journey like for you? What I, was the thing? I don't know. Yeah. For some reason, the first thing I thought of now, when you're telling the story back, I'm thinking of Ishmael. Do you remember Ishmael? That was part of POC and he became <gasps> yes, a quieto yes, yes, star. Yes, yes, yes. And he also had like many different names at one Ishmael stage. Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he he like just sort of evolved. And I think at one point his name had nothing to do with Ishmael also. Yes. Or yes. Either way. Um, so obviously there is an, a need at times to do uh, rebranding. And what had happened is the Hearing Aid brand was, if I have to paint a, a very vivid, quick picture, it was underground, it was hip hop. It was associated with outreach, ministry projects, upliftment in the community. That was, if I use just flash words, that was more or less what that brand was associated with. And I think what had happened is I had always had a, a ambition to, to invade more of the contemporary spaces. Man. So events that do not necessarily appreciate hip-hop music and the underground component thereof, but more of the contemporary vibes and not necessarily hip hop also uh, multidisciplinary or what is the term nowadays that they use open format um, because that's where I thought I saw myself better I can play to any crowd at any given time with any specific genre not necessarily limiting myself but what I realized very quickly is um, as we network and we go through this journey we meet people we meet DJs we meet people that are very good at PR at branding, uh, uh, social media, and things like that. And then I realized that the name, it doesn't really work in a, in a contemporary space, man. You know? <laughs> you like I was getting, twice. I yeah. was getting a lot of love from hip-hop heads 
for the concept of the name and what it meant and they were really feeling it and some of them still today tell me you should have never dropped that name and I understand where they're coming from if I wanted to stay in the underground hip hop scene or to just do community upliftment projects which is usually free projects by the way <laughs> <laughs> so, <you> <laughs> so, so um, I understand where they were coming from but from where, where I looked at it, it the name was not making sense it was flying over the heads of just people wanting a good time or oh, a okay. party and so, stuff like that and so I felt like, like I needed I couldn't keep the name and the identity and mo just move into a new space I needed a completely new start I needed to recreate the brand in totality it is not anymore what it used to be it is something totally different now and uh, it's it's like you were excellent at cricket, but you're going to try soccer now. You're still going to apply the same physicality and the same uh, sportsman etiquette, but you're just going to try it a little bit differently this time. Okay. So that's how I sort of viewed the journey when I went that way. Yeah. Okay, so th it was kind of like the hip-hop audience that is they appreciate wordplay yes. and they appreciate double meaning. For them, it was clever. Mm. But you go to like a mainstream club and yeah. people are like, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? How would people, come again? Typically, how would in, people typically respond when you say you're hearing it? In the quiet words of the Virgin Mary, come again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can you sketch a little bit of a picture about what that was like? like? Because you were effectively starting from scratch. Yeah. You took this brand down to ground level mm. and then you had to build it up again. Yeah, so that was a... It wasn't a difficult process, I would say. It was it was exciting, actually, um, because it's it's a fresh start, it's a new beginning, and I think sometimes what we do, uh, not necessarily just in music or in a creative space, but in life in general, we don't make enough time to analyze what we are doing and why we are doing it, and if it is actually making us happy or not. And so when you start to do that. You then start to pick up that there's things that you actually would like to change. It's not necessarily just the name that you're changing, but there's a lot of aspects of. So now, with branding comes what is your once you've got an idea of what you want to do. Now you start to unpack, but but who is this person then? Why does what would such a person look like? What would the image be like? Well, um, you know, what kind of difference do you bring to the peers that play in that space? You start to unpack a whole lot of components around this new brand, and that can become very exciting. And it's not so a name change, it, it was a rebrand. It was a total and complete rebrand. Um, it was an image rebrand, it was a name rebrand. I think before um, Ivy Beach, there was no beard even. So so that came that came as part of the journey. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so for all of those that are still asking me, like two years later to shave the beard, it's not coming off, it's part of the brand, it's in the logo, it's everywhere. Yeah, you can't, it's in yeah, we, we, We're pushing for, for beard oil products and all of those <laughs> things, it's, it's not coming down yeah, anytime soon. Okay, so that was very much a BTB era before the beard. <laughs> and now we are in the post-beard dispensation, Yo. where the beard has in fact been entrenched yes. and has been cultivated over many years. It has been carefully manicured for many years, yes. I don't even think I have a gevaarlijke razor. To, to, if I had to try to shave it, I would probably put all the razors. Yeah, it would be a disaster. Them. Yeah, you can't, you've come too far now. And also, it's been too long, man. Do I even know how to shave? Yeah, in fact, how could you? That's more a skill that you forget over time. <laughs> you might cut yourself, you know, cause I'm serious pretty sure, injury. I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah well. um, I just want to ask one more question about that time, because... It's such a pivotal time in your career. Yeah. It's such a pivotal time in your, your brand as such. Um, how did you stay the course? Because I'm sure if you had to weigh up the people who were in favor of the, the rebrand versus people who were against the rebrand, it, it was probably like 30, 70, even probably like 70% of people who were saying like, yeah. no man, but why do you want to? And why must you change? And Do I have that split about yeah. right? Yeah, what, what, what I did is I had a consult, uh, uh, what do you call it, a focus group, basically. But it wasn't formal. It was people that are in the industry playing in the spaces where I wanted to be. People that I trust, that have actually done very big things, brand ambassadors for major uh, brands in the industry, that have played at all the events that, 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 that you really want to be playing at, at in that space. And so I tested the name with them in comparison with what I had before. And the consensus was was pretty much unanimous in that regard. So I felt very confident that it was going to work. 
And um, yeah, I think I did enough homework at the time. It was catchy enough. It was contemporary. It was relevant. And then obviously also um, I um, I used the services of Cognitive to help me with a with a basically the look of what this brand would be once it is completed or to give it sort of a street feel uh, to give it all the components that I had painted initially to be the new brand and that just gave me that whole fresh uh, look when it came out you know it, uh, really I tried logos on my own like sh just shortly after rebranding and you know most when you do things on your own man oh yeah I look, I look why for you yes I yeah, look, yeah, yeah you yeah. think it's hard because you spent hours <laughs> and hours on it you put in the, the time yes if you draw a picture of a dog now it's the first time you draw a picture of a dog you're gonna think oh this is a file it does look like a dog and until you see someone that actually paints dogs for a living and then you're like nah, okay, yeah. um, maybe it's time to outsource. maybe this is just for at home yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's time to outsource. And so I went to see a pro and I think um, the guys at Cognitive smashed it. They knocked it out of the park. I think we did about three or four different variations before we settled. And yeah, that really helped me also springboard onto new things. And then I started also unpacking um, besides just the look and the, and the sound more, more towards which areas this brand would function and live in and, and, and what stages would I see it operating in? What other business ventures and avenues would I see it operating in? And so it's just been growing from there. So I'm very blessed to have that um, growth up until now mm. with a new brand. I think we've far surpassed what we did with the previous brand. So Oh, for sure. Yeah. In a short space of time. Yeah. In a very short space of time. But that is a powerful lesson that I'm hearing there mm. is that you need to be... You need to be checking who you're listening to, man. Mm. Because the people around you are not necessarily yes men. Mm. You know, we weren't necessarily just people who agreed with everything yeah. you said. But because we like you and, you know, there's a level of bias there, man. Mm. When you speak to me, for example. Because yeah. I was also one of the people who was like, ah, you know, you're in it. It's catchy. <laughs> nah, people who, people who are saying it's hard to understand. Mm. They hate us. And, you know, I was very much cheering for you. But yeah. I... I realize now there must, there should definitely, must definitely have been an element just of, of some bias yeah. there because we're so close and because, yeah. you know, I like you as a person. So I'm hearing a powerful lesson in terms of who are you listening to yes. and who are you taking business advice or career advice from? Yes, definitely. I mean, if we were going to continue in the space that we were playing in all the time, then yes, I mean, you are a key player in that area. But the moment I start talking events and clubs and uh, DJ related events, then I need to start talking to people in that space that is hard in the thick of that space. Um, let's call it uh, specialists in that area, so to say. Um, if I was to talk about being more involved in the local music scene, uh, performing arts, bands, uh, local hip hop Afrikaans, then I would have definitely, obviously, made you the focal point of any sort of um, um, focus group, so to say, mm -hmm. just to get the consensus of what I'm, if what I'm doing is the right thing. So, absolutely, I agree with you. It's very important to select the team, and it's not selected based on emotion or things like that. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, so I had to look at who the players are, you know, and I attended a few. Um, sessions with guys that that were giving talks on branding um, especially what you put on your socials man uh, and i think the lesson is this or the test is this uh, let me share something with you i post random memes and jokes on my on my facebook profile but what people don't understand is if you go back on my profile you won't find it i posted for a period of time to build metrics and to boost engagement and then i hide it after the fact and so why I do that is merely just for the numbers. But if you look at the profile, the test is this. Let's take today's date. What's the date today? It's the... The 29th of okay, November. Okay, so the 29th of November. Go on your Facebook right now and go back three years to the 29th of November and go and see what you posted. Does those posts that you made on that date reflect your brand? Or is it just a bunch of jokes? Is it just a bunch of weird... Uh, personal, uh, you know, stuff that you're posting, you know. Um, yes, you can do that, but if you're a brand, you need to be professional. You need to be on brand. Your posts must speak to who you are and what image you're trying to put out there. And so 
Those are the kinds of light bulb moments that came in the last few years with the rebranding exercise is to post relevant uh, what the image that you're putting out there must speak to where you're going and what you're trying to do because that at the end of the day is what you want event uh, promoters and people to see. Mm. You know? It must be on brand. In it short. must be on brand in short, yeah. And for it to be for you to be able to make that call, you need to have a good understanding yes. of what your brand is. Exactly. I will never forget. I think you mentioned once there was on the Kales River community mm. page on Facebook there was a tattoo guy, and you went to go and check out what he posted, and it was something like. <laughs> Yo, I'm having a little cup of coffee in the inch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been awesome now for him to post about it. <laughs> yeah, like in the moment, that must have been quite a cup of coffee and quite the inch in the moment, but not something that necessarily is going to build your brand. Yeah. Or maybe it's 100% yeah. on brand, you know, yes. but it's you need to make that call. Most deaf, yeah. most deaf. Um, okay, so here's the question. Um, and I think this applies not just not just to other DJs, but also to other creatives. And in fact, other people who are running some kind of enterprise. How do I know when it's time to rebrand? Yeah, that is a difficult one. I think you, you, nobody can tell you necessarily when it's time to rebrand. It's something that you will need to, you will need to feel and be convinced within yourself that something needs to change and it can be driven many ways it can be that you're not achieving certain results that you were expecting it can be that the image that you're putting out there is not necessarily uh, uh, satisfying you or your your uh, target audience anymore uh, it could be that times are changing and you need to adapt and you're figuring out that you know maybe my presence is is sort of <laughs> retro, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's many, there's many reasons that that a person could become, um, uh, how can I put it, tempted to change brand. Yeah. Maybe I mean, with a ceiling. You I mean, with a ceiling in terms of where you can go. You could list better than me artists that are all the times, you know, that uh, their brand hasn't changed. They just adapted to whatever was happening around them, and they're still true to their values and the. All of that, you know, the full package is still there. I mean, the Jamiroquai album, when it started out to where it is before they lost, or the last album that they recorded, you would notice, you know, it's the same um, out there, you know, band that you can expect anything from, very funk orientated, but they rolled with the times where it was very hardcore band related music in the beginning like it became hardcore acid jazz in the lots beginning. of electro influenced uh, electronic music influence uh, edm whatever the case may be influence later on so they rolled with the punches they didn't need to rebrand they just needed to put more content out and engage now every say two or three years you, there's more people coming into the listening market how do you how do you include them yes <laughs> over yeah. a period of 10 years how many people were added to the listening market as kids grow up you know as your listenership grow how do you engage everybody and so i think we must all be mindful of that but if what you are doing is really not in line with where you are going then you need to rebrand and you can only do that if you regularly uh, take stock you know if you do strategic sessions and and really ask yourself am i still on my is my goal and my uh, ob uh, objectives uh, is, is my my um my, are my actions actually taking me in that direction or not? If there's no results, then you need to look at if what you're doing is still working. And one of that is going to be obviously your branding. Is your branding... Are, are you pushing the brand enough is another question. You might have a brilliant brand, but you're just not focused enough or you're just not pushing it hard enough. Um, you know, I see a lot of guys, especially in the local hip-hop scene, and I'm not um, outing anyone specifically, but you see it all the time. There are brilliant guys out there, but they're not really working or they're not really pushing. Their content is amazing, but they can't expect to just put content out and it's going to just do everything for itself. It's a music business. It's not just about putting music out there. The business side implies there's some hard work. There's a strategy. There's, you know, you must be intentional about what you're doing. Posts, everything, everything is on social media now, so you can't afford to be quiet on the socials also. So there's a lot of... There's a lot of factors around yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Just for me, it was important to change because where I was going and where I wanted to be, there was a conflict. And that was like a very clear line that I had to 
and then you couldn't come with. <laughs> the name you the name you the car was clear full yeah. The name you like that. Eddie bus come with. Okay, um um I think that's very well answered. I think you've answered that really clearly and specifically. Um and my next question kind of pertains to that. It's also on the topic of branding and when I look at the Ivy Beats brand and I look at where you are now versus you know where you started out a short time ago there is a definite trend for me where you are moving in a direction clearly you have an idea of who you want to be you have an idea of who you want to be and you are actively pursuing that and kind of grooming the brand in that direction how do you manage to consistently be moving your brand in a positive direction in your case you're moving at upscale you're moving it to a more premium audience and for a more premium perception the next guy might be might be he wants to move to a more mainstream so really whatever it may be i'm not saying the goal for everyone should be to move upscale yeah. but that's definitely the trend that i'm seeing with your brand how do you to what do you create that consistency i think um if i understand the question properly um if if you have a a strategic goal you you know exactly where you want to end up and then you've got to have i think goals that are although they're realistic you must also have dreams beyond that something that that pulls you a little hard because of how far the stretch is to actually reach it if i were to say to you for argument sake one of your goals should be that with um development to take people to mars you want to be one of the first artists to perform on mars that is totally out there that sounds just impossible but such so big is the goal that the pull and the, and the, and the effect it will have on you to perform to get to that level will be such that you will surpass your 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 realistic goals with a relative ease or you might find that you need to to adjust your goals regularly because you are going to reach them quicker than what you thought you would because the dream is bigger yeah yeah the dream is so big that it's pushing you and it's and it's and it's and it's really challenging you beyond and it demands an obsessive focus so so i don't have a a um a very um outlandish dream per se but what i realized is also you can add additional spheres to what you are doing so instead of just aiming to like if you play if, let's say you are a club dj you up and come your goal is you want to play at all the best nightclubs in town in cape town um or in south africa for argument for argument sake um that's all you want to do what i found is why don't you explore other spheres that you can play in try to play festivals try to play um um uh for brands for businesses try to play for artists you know branch out beyond just the club environment and that will also help you grow that will also help you grow. so that's what i've been doing i've been adding um additional spheres related to music even business adding other little mini businesses around what i'm trying to do to build the brand and that have also made a difference for me beyond just going in a straight line you create a little bit of a buzz around what you are doing day to day as well and you take all of that with you. Yeah. So 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 that have been um pretty much I I my modus operandi until now. And I mean it's a learning curve. So there's certain things that I know <laughs> worked and certain things that don't, <laughs> that, <laughs> that don't work and uh, also focusing your time on what actually is taking you forward because you can get busy with a whole lot of stuff that does not actually aid you in going to where you are headed. And so that makes a difference as well. You know, um if you are always going to be trying to get into places, um then you're always going to be that guy, man. Ah, the guy with cap in hand begging for a gig. If you're that guy, then that's how people are going to perceive you also. Rather come then from the top down and rather say I'm going to have my own event. And once I have that, um I am then not just approaching the other brands around me for gigs. I'm approaching them as a fellow member of the co- events community and then it becomes less of a situation of them throwing you a bone and more of a situation of let's work together because we see you as a peer so all those things are additional add-ons that you need to consider to who you are and where you're going it's not just about making a beeline between immediately what I'm doing now in my bedroom and where I want to be in 10 years time you need to consider what am i doing day to day what other activities am i plugged into 
that's creating the image that I need for where I'm going actually and mm -hmm. not just me trying to go you know in with my hands yeah, out yeah, yeah. asking for opportunities and going to knock on doors and stuff yeah. like that yeah. and it's funny how that works eh? because if you're busy if you're gigging yeah that kind of builds its own momentum and it builds its own success busy guys get big get yeah busy guys get booked yeah you know the guy who's sitting at home waiting for the gig to yeah. come in somehow he, because he doesn't have any movement he's not yeah. generating that forward momentum most definitely but i think also your thought process is key man like uh, a guy that used to work with me that retired, he used to tell me one of the best habits that you can have is to wake up very early in the morning because you're giving your brain a lot more time to think. So by the time other people get to work, your brain is functioning 100%. You've already figured out at least two to three key problems. You've refined a thinking around a certain area. You, your personal issues are not actually with you at work anymore because you've already had time to deal with them before your morning actually started. And so, yes, thinking is very important also. We, I think sometimes we live so rushed that we are so consumed with going from activity A to B that there's no time actually for your brain to work and figure things out naturally. So I like to take time out regularly to think about what I'm doing, what activities actually are key, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And also another thing is the work that I've been doing with the, with the academy um, as an instructor there, working with students have also been awesome because you've been able to share that journey with other people also, man, you know. Um, I think that is also key, you know, doing things that make you feel good as a person. You know, you feel good about yourself because you've done certain things, you've made certain mistakes and you could actually share that with a next generation. And that will be your legacy at the end of the day. I mean, how many students have come through me as an as instructor now? Those guys are still in contact with me. Even though I don't see them as often as I used to, they'll still inbox me. They'll still like and share my stuff online. And uh, yes, they're part of my community, so to say, as well. And me of theirs as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a liquor environment. The DJ industry is a liquor community. It's a small community. You can't talk bad about anyone. You know, it's going to come out. Because you can't hide. You can't hide. There's, there's, only so many, there's only so many of us around. Although it feels like there's a lot of them now. But still, man, it's a small world. And you have to be you have to be neutral with everyone. You have to be Switzerland. You can't be. And although it's clicky, it's extremely clicky, that is not uh, uh, beneficial if you're going to move just in certain clicks. Man. Try to be Switzerland. Try to be in with everyone. So, yeah, those are the things that I've been applying that have been working for me so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I remember... I often talk about to other people about you, about how glad I am that you're teaching because I just, you have such a passion for what you do mm. um, and you have such a way with audiences and I'm really, really glad in myself, selfishly for you yeah. that you are teaching <laughs> yeah, that other people get to enjoy that aspect yeah. of your personality. That's really great to hear. And th th do you find that keeps you sharp as well? Because I think, I often tell people, you think you know a thing until you need to explain yes. it to the next person. That's true, yes. Look, the work with QDJ Academy has been, has been a very special time in my life. Right? Like a lot of my development came through that process. And so it was just natural that when it came time to give back and to also participate as an as a, as a instructor on that side of things, that it came very easy to share um, with the... With with the students that came through and yes they keep you on your toes because they're all, always asking questions that is not in your script you know what <laughs> i mean um and yes you get tested at times because they'll ask you questions and if your explanation doesn't add up because it's a practical activity you have to be able to demonstrate that it, what you are saying you have to actually show it as well so if it doesn't add up it causes you you're going to sit with egg on your face if you, if you can't correctly explain certain concepts or things like that. So, yes, definitely keeps you on your toes from a technical point of view. But also, you spend a lot of time looking at what people are doing um, as students. And you pick up here and there, you know, uh, certain behaviors um, in how they conduct themselves as business people, as musicians or as artists. Because a lot of the guys nowadays are into producing as well. They are, there's a big movement now. To, you'll see all the hundreds of local gum and Afro house producers, I'm a piano producers, there's a lot of them now. And Cape Town actually plays, plays a huge part in the gum community in South Africa at the moment. The Cape Town sound is, is actually one of the better sounds 
in that uh, genre at the mm-hmm. moment. And all their and names start with DJ. <laughs> <laughs> the DJ this, DJ, DJ that. Leg yeah, yeah, with your producer. No, I must tell you, that some of the guys that I like now, Walume, Walume boys, you know, they name those sort of DJ, but I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of guys out there now, and you'll be surprised what they are able to achieve with very minimal resources. I mean, they basically stay with their mom, they have a laptop, they use earbud, in ear earphones, you know, there's no monitors, there's no mixers, there's no... And these guys are out there producing and they're making music and people are actually consuming it, you know. It's not professionally uh, crafted music in studios with mastering and mixing and things like that. These are guys are doing these things in the bedroom. And uh, yes, they are able to actually get their music to the point of consumption. They bypass perhaps the, the, fa- the, 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 monetary, the monetary aspect of, of, of how music is supposed to be consumed. But at the end of the day, if your music is trash, no one is supposed to be listening to it, but their music is, is getting consumed. Yeah. So so there's a lot of things to, to look at. In I mean, for me, coming from the old school where DJ just played music, you know, you're featured with bands as a hip-hop DJ, but now we're playing in a different space now where people are actually looking more towards production and playing their own content or creating their own content. And so, yeah, it's a very interesting time to love and especially to teach because <laughs> <laughs> you must be at the forefront you must know what's going on yes. when you tell other people what's when they on. mention these names you have to at least know a few of them <laughs> <laughs> you can't be like who what uh, <laughs> do you ever like um yeah, yeah i know course. about them yes yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah i mean this has been amazing there's all these other threads now that i want to go into but we've already been busy for 40 minutes I'm going to close out with two more questions. Firstly, what are you busy with now? And where can people get hold of you? That's one question, although it sounds like two. And then secondly, who is the greatest club DJ of all time? (laughs) (laughs) Hectic. Yo, gevaarlijke question at the the end. Um, What I'm busy with at the moment, uh, like I said, there's an event brand that I'm still working on. It's also an apparel brand. So um, look out for Dope Society on Facebook and Insta. Um, the apparel side of things have been slow going, but we are still procuring proper service providers to execute everything that we're busy with. And uh, we're looking to launch product very soon. And then, um, yes, I'm still resident on the Ready D show. I think this is my fourth year now that I'm with, with D on the show. Uh, before that, I was just as a guest occasionally. Uh, so it's always great to work with legends like that. Yeah. I mean, to work, walk into a studio. And see Ready D and have him acknowledge you as part of his crew or his team is unbelievable, man. Like you grew up as a lighter seeing Ready D and hearing him on the radio. And and now you can say you're part of the team. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's an other feeling till today. Still get goosebumps. And so there's that. Um, I was recently involved with um, residencies at two different clubs. Um, I have unfortunately had to save ties because of COVID-19 and the issues rela- uh, surrounding that. I think it's also important to be responsible, man. You know, you can go for gigs and gig everywhere, but is it safe to do so? Is it responsible to do so? And so I think this is also why my partner and I decided we're going to hold back on physical events until it is really responsible and safe to do so. Yeah, yeah. Not just we with the law season. We don't want to do it just because it's okay to do it and exploit the loopholes that there are. We know there are loopholes that allow you to have events. But is it the right thing to do? Is it the response? How would you feel if an outbreak happened at your event? And how would you even be able to defend that? I mean, I've been, and this is an issue that I maybe shouldn't be talking about, but I've been to events during lockdown. And there are very little protocols being observed. I mean, as DJs, we are fighting, and as the entertainment industry, we are fighting to say, listen, they must lift the restrictions so that the industry can survive this. What about the people must survive this, man? You know what I mean? (laughs) Everybody must survive this, not just the industry, because while you are trying to get back to a good financial footing and to thrive, your actions mustn't uh, compromise people's health and safety. So... Doing the responsible thing is also who I think as a brand we are. So we must stay on brand. And so that, that's, that's where I'm at in terms of activities mostly. Um, I have also a brand ambassadorship that I just newly started out with. So I'm creating lots of content for them as well. And, and that is another stream of income, revenue and activities, man. You know, you're creating content now. We live in that world now. Yeah, we don't yeah. just, we don't just so rap and we don't just make series. We create content. Yeah, content yeah. creation is like... 
is a huge part of every artist, DJ, personalities, day to day. And often social media currency can almost be the same as yeah. income, you know. It, yes. It puts you in, in a certain bracket, it puts you in Most front definitely. of the right eyes. Most definitely. I mean, that is what you use to sell nowadays. You know, whereas before you would say CD sales or you would say, you know, I've performed at the following major events that lends a certain credibility to you, that lends a certain professionalism to you. Now brands are interested. I mean, I inboxed, a, I don't want to mention the name, a major festival. I think it was two or three years ago. And I asked them what the requirements would be uh, to enter the, um, <laughs> to be considered. For <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing the brand asked me is, listen, uh, we need you to have at least like 5,000 followers on YouTube. Can you show us what direct? And I was like, wow, look where we've, where, where we've got nothing to do with your technical ability, your musicality. You know, it's good. they want to know who are you bringing with yeah. to our event. Who, they're not looking who, for how many clips eyes? Of, they're looking for clips yeah. of how you're playing. Yes. Who's watching you? How many people are, have eyes on you? That was like an eye opener for me to say, look, you must have content and you must grow an audience. So, yeah, that's mm. what I'm at. And who's the best club DJ in the world? Yes, that's my bro. That's hectic. I would have to say for me, this is now not going to agree with many South African Owens. <laughs> Internationally, um, there's two. I'm, I'm conflicted. I will say Reddy D always. Reddy D always. Every day. All day. But there's another guy that I've followed for many years. And he's not maybe big here. But Carl Cox has to be the legend that I must choose for all-time greatest club DJ. I mean, he's been doing this for 40 years. And, um, or close to 40 years. And uh, he said something the other day that struck me. He, he recently moved, not recently, say a few years ago, he moved away from the conventional DJ equipment. So he's using, you, are you familiar with the tractor? I think it's the D8 or the S8, the one that has no jog wheels. It's all in one yes, controller. Yes, yes, yeah. But it has buttons pads, and pads buttons, and knobs, yeah. but there's no actual wheel that you can manipulate. I read an article where he advocates strongly for that thing. Yeah. Yes, and he was using this uh, solely and then you also would obviously add other components that are traditional like your cdjs and your turntables and they asked him but now don't you feel uncomfortable moving to this isn't it like copping out you're not using real dj equipment anymore it's like sort of you know it's like virtual dj vibes and whatever and his and his response was very simple and it was i think he imposed himself in the sense that listen this is where i come from man I got nothing to prove after 40 years of mixing on ordinary DJ equipment <laughs> anymore. Why do I still need to prove this to anyone, man? Yeah. If I'm going to use this now and it's making my sets better, it's not like I started yesterday. I've been doing this for 30 years on all of the equipment that, like, what more do I need to prove? Man? And yeah. that really put into context for me who he was as a person and as a, as a professional. He's been doing this for too long to still be questioned. He's had residences in Ibiza all over the world. He played in South Africa, I'll never forget, one year on the New Year's Eve. Um, he played three cities um, in one night. He played three New Year's Eve parties in one night in three different countries. Oh, that's epic. Yo. So he flew back in time to be at one of those parties. I mean, that is just stuff that is like superhero vibes, man. Yeah, yeah, it's not normal. <laughs> he played now for New Year's Eve. He flies back in time to play another New Year's <laughs> Eve like that, man. It's just crazy. It's insane. That's the stuff of legend, <laughs> yeah. It's hectic. <laughs> yeah. Ivan, thank you. This has been amazing. Find Ivy Beats everywhere on your socials. Follow his mix cloud. There is another subject yeah. we can talk about Yo. at a different time. <laughs> can of worms, can of worms. We're not getting into it here. But thank you so much for joining. And it's been really epic talking to you as always. Yeah, thanks for having me. But it was always like to chat to you. Always, always. always.